All right, I think we will get started. So, um, hi everyone, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Ina Lupin. I'm the program manager for the Community Assistance for Climate Equity team, which administers the Regional Climate Collaboratives Program. Um, we are going to be talking through the full application process today. Um, and I am here with two of my colleagues who are going to be helping lead this workshop with me. Um, uh, Kavleen Singh will be walking us through the application submission process in the second portion of the webinar. Kavleen, would you introduce yourself? Yes, okay. uh, sorry. <laughs> um, hi, it's not letting me start my video, um, but hi everybody. I'm Kavleen, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a program associate with um, the RCC team, and um, I'll pass it to Sarah. Uh, awesome, thanks Kavleen. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Risher. I'm a program analyst um, on the RCC team, and I'm just thrilled to have you all uh, here with us today. And I'll kick it back to you, Ina. Great, thank you. Um, so for folks who are joining the call, we'd love for you to also introduce yourself if you'd like to via the chat. You can share your name, organization, and the region that you work in if you'd like. Um, we also ask that you please stay on mute for the duration of the presentation today. You can post questions into the Q&A box at any point during the presentation, and we will do our best to answer as many of those questions as we can. Um, if you prefer to ask a question verbally, we will ask that you raise your hand during the Q&A session, um, and then we can call on you to come F mute and ask your question. Um, and we, we do have quite a bit of time set aside for Q&A, but if there are any questions that we don't get to today, we will be following up with the Q&A document and we'll include any questions that were asked, even the ones that we haven't responded to verbally during the webinar. So, um, no worries about that. You'll definitely get your questions responded to. Um, and also, before I kind of start to jump into the agenda today, I wanted to really thank those of you who submitted pre-proposals. We received a lot of really great submissions, and so we're in the process of reviewing them. Um, as a reminder for folks who are on the call today, pre-proposals aren't required. Um, but they are highly recommended because we can't guarantee technical assistance to any applicants who did not submit a pre-proposal. So if you're planning on applying but have not yet submitted a pre-proposal, the deadline was last Friday, um, but you're still welcome to apply. We just can't necessarily guarantee that you would receive um, technical assistance. So, um, we are in the process of reviewing pre-proposals, as I mentioned earlier, so we are planning on sending written feedback to all of the applicants and we'll be also putting you in touch with your TA providers the week of August 1st. Um, we are trying to get those out as quickly as we can. If we can get them out any quicker, we certainly will, but we did get quite a bit of interest in the program, so um, likely we won't be able to commit to getting any feedback back sooner than that. Um, and so I think we can dive into the agenda with that. Now that the pre-proposal deadline is behind us, we have an opportunity to kind of really dive in on the full application process. Um, so we're going to focus today on the materials um, related to the full application and the submission process. We'll go through the process around technical assistance scoring criteria, timeline and resources, and then we'll have that significant amount of time for, for Q&A as well. Next slide, please. So I imagine at this phase, probably many of you are already familiar with the RCC program, but for anyone who may need a refresher, the program, um, we're in the first round of the program and we have $3.5 million that are available for award ranging between 500,000 and 1.75 million. Uh, the program is really focused on assisting under-resourced communities to help them access statewide public and other grants. Um, the program will be funding cross-sectoral networks of partners in under-resourced communities to help them access funding and advance climate related solutions. So we have a two-phase application process, as I mentioned earlier, the pre-proposal stage ended on Friday, and then the full application um, 
we actually were able to post on July 7th and the due date will be October 7th. So there's a full three month window in there um, for folks to get in their, um, their full applications. And then you'll see that we also have a link here to more background on the program. Obviously, that's a very high level um, overview of the RCC program. So please do uh, take advantage of that information that we have on our website to dive into more of the details. Next slide, please. Great. So these are the required components of the full application on this slide. We have the general narrative questions, um, which you'll find on our website. Um, we have an application workbook, which includes um, a template for the work plan, the budget, a detailed staff costing sheet, and then um, a Gantt chart. And within that workbook, we also have um, like specific examples that you can take a look at to kind of better understand how to use each one of those templates. Um, I just want to add a, a disclaimer that, you know, the, the examples that we put forward are not in order to kind of show what an ideal RCC would look like, but are really to help you better understand how to use those tools. So use them to the extent that they're helpful, but um, certainly no need to stick to anything that's written in there. Um, in terms of the next phase, we also have a requirement to create a partnership agreement. There's information in our guidelines around the requirements for the partnership agreement, and we've also provided a template um, that you're welcome to use if you would like um, for creating that partnership agreement among the partners in your collaborative stakeholder structure. Um, we also ask for an organizational chart or a diagram of the collaborative stakeholder structure can be something that's quite simple, but that's really just able to show how all of the partners will work together. Um, we're also looking for a region and communities of focus map um, that shows, you know, what that regional boundary is that you've created, as well as the communities of focus um, that you'll be selecting um, as a part of your, um, your application. And the TA providers will be able to provide some support on mapping um, if that's something that uh, that applicants feel they need. So um, we do have that support available. Um, we also will be asking for a resolution or letter of authorization from the managing stakeholder. So um, whether that agency, if, that's, if it's a public agency that's putting together the resolution, um, we do have a template that's available on our website, which we'll talk about in a little bit more in a moment. Um, if the organization that's putting it forward is a tribe, then they can also either do a tribal resolution or a letter of authorization. Um, and so we also have a template on our website for that. Um, if the organization is neither a public agency or a tribe, um, such as a community-based organization or another type of organization, um, you can either offer a resolution um, coming from the governing body of your organization or a formal letter authorizing um, the submission of this grant. So there's more information in the guidelines on that piece as well. And then we do lastly require letters of commitment from each of the um, each of the partners as a part of this the collaborative stakeholder structure. And again, we will be posting um, a a kind of template it's very simple but that you all will be able to use in order to put together those letters so next we can go to the next slide and then these are the optional components that um, folks are welcome to use if you would like or welcome to include so reference letters are not required but certainly recommended um, uh, to the extent that they can make a, a really strong case for the applicants being able to carry out the activities that are set aside in the work plan. Letters of support are also welcome. Um, if there are partners that may not be a formal partner within the collaborative stakeholder structure, but that may be engaged in some way, shape, or form, um, or if there are folks who might be benefiting from the Regional Climate Collaborative, um, they can certainly provide letters of support. And then lastly, background documentation. If there is um, you know, an example where 
an applicant would like to be able to show some past work that they've done that's relevant to what they plan to do as a part of the RCC um, or other types of documentation that can really help bolster their application. We also welcome um, that information, but it is optional. Next slide, please. So Kathleen will be walking through in a moment all of the um, all of these different tools and um, and resources that we have on our website, but I'm just going to walk through them super quickly just to give you a flavor for what each one of them is. So frequently asked questions, I think, is pretty self-explanatory, uh, but we have a collective impact resources document that offers some general um, examples, best practices, tools um, that folks may want to take into consideration when they are putting together um, their, their collaborative structure. Um, we also offer an under-resourced communities eligibility map. This is just a PDF map that shows all of the areas of the state that qualify as under-resourced communities. Um, we don't necessarily recommend using it in, um, for those eligibility questions um, since it is just a PDF, um, but it can be a helpful resource. Um, what we do recommend you using though, when you wanna focus on the um, sort of geographic eligibility for the program is the region and communities of focus guidance memo, which really offers a tutorial with some of the different mapping tools and kind of helps to dive in a little bit more on the specific requirements related to um, geographic eligibility for the program. Next, we have an example strategy table. The strategy table kind of gives some examples of what strategies might look like for a regional climate collaborative. Um, it's, I think, a nice piece to kind of complement the example work plan that we have as a part of the workbook. Um, and again, similarly, these are just ideas to kind of help inspire um, applicants to the extent that it's helpful, but no need to stick to any of those um, specific um, examples or um, you know, to kind of use that as a, as a jumping off point. Next, we have full application instructions, which again, I think are pretty self-explanatory, um, a partnership agreement template as well, as well as resolution templates, which I mentioned earlier, a letter of authorization checklist, for tribal applicants, which kind of walks through all of the different pieces that are required as a part of the letter of authorization. Um, we also have a template as well, and then a letter of commitment template. So with that, I think I will hand it over to Kavleen to kind of show, show where all of those documents live and, um, and walk through the materials and the submission process for, um, for the application. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Ina. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to do a new screen share now and move us away from the PowerPoint for a moment. And let's see, let me end this one. Okay. And share it again. So um, this is the application materials webpage. And I'm gonna show you all super quick how to get here just from the SGC website. So assuming, assuming one just comes here. And then there's the programs that SGC has and we are community assistance. And then if we scroll down to the end of the community assistance page to resources, click here. This is the, oh, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> um, it is here. So sorry about that. It is the middle tab with the available now round one notice of funding availability. Click learn more. And then this is the resources page. It's a general resources page. And then you would click on current application materials button. And it gets you to the page that I showed you when I first started the screen share. And this page has brief descriptions of the um, all the application materials, the pre-proposal information, which is no longer um, 
no longer uh, will be using since the pre-proposal deadline passed. So you can just go to the full application section. Um, below that is all the resources that um, Ina just uh, described. And so they're all linked here. And then um, to access the application packet, it's this hyperlink in the full application section of the web page. And so clicking on it will lead it to download a zip folder. When we click that open, it will show everything that is in the packet, which include the application instructions, the workbook, and then the various um, documents that Ina um, described previously. So I'm just gonna go over the workbook for a moment. Um, sorry, that was another Excel spreadsheet I had open. Um, so the workbook has several different tabs and one can begin at the applicant summary which is on the very left tab. And then you can work in any order that makes sense, but I'm just gonna go from the left to the right tabs um, to show what the workbook contains. And this is enter the information that's asked for along here. The work plan um, template. Um, Kathleen, I think we're actually not able to see the Excel spreadsheet if you're showing it right now. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me um, do a new screen share. I always forget that Zoom um, has you share new screens. Um, I am here. Okay. Is that better? Can you all see that? Yeah, that's better. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that to my attention, Ina. Um, sorry about that. I keep forgetting that Zoom needs me to change each time. So this is the applicant summary. Um, tab of the workbook. And uh, like I mentioned previously, the workbook has all these tabs at the bottom that um, you would move through when completing it. And then here's the work plan template that <clears throat> you would fill out as part of your application. There's some instructions here. Um, and then there's a budget to fill. And um, so each um, tab has an instruction section at the top. And then there's also, um, it's important to fill out this top portion of the managing stakeholder proposal name region. Uh, these are at the top of every tab as well. And then there's a staff cost page, which uh, will break down the staff and their hours and then um, the rates so that that can all be seen here. Then there is a Gantt chart template to visualize the project schedule, and it will be kind of similarly filled out to uh, the how the budget looks with the strategies, tasks, and the description. Um, and then the this calendar portion would just be highlighted. And there's also examples to give an idea on how to fill those out. So there's example tabs of everything that I just shared, which contain um, sample text and um, also some guidance on how to interpret this uh, example. And then here is a budget example, example staff cost detail. It just exemplifies how this all would be filled out. And then here's an example of the schedule. And so there's the description here. You would put your dates and then reflect the dates visually by highlighting where they would fit on the calendar uh, portion of the chart. There is an activity key to help fill out the work plan because the work plan has um, an RCC activities addressed column, which will help um, help applicants see that they addressed all required and optional uh, activities to meet the threshold. And then there is also a definitions tab at the very end to help um, 
just in case there's something, um, some term in the workbook that one would need more clarification on um, or to double check, uh, it's all here. And now I will stop that screen share and go back to the applications page. So you would need to fill out this application survey in order to actually submit the application packet. And uh, it is a Microsoft Forms. Uh, I just want to double check. Can everyone see the Microsoft Form? Um, yes. Traveling. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Sarah. So this is how applicants will submit their application packet. And it's so that we have your collaborative information and more importantly, point of contact and a single email address um, that SGC, like it says here, the primary email address SGC should communicate with regarding the application and submission folder. Basically the um, submission folder would be shared with members of your collaborative and um, we would create a folder, share it with the emails that are provided here. And then um, by the deadline, applicants will be able to submit their um, application in a SharePoint folder. So it's really important to make sure that this information is submitted. And again, um, this can all be found on the application materials web page. And um, I can drop a link to this in the chat super quick as well, so that um, folks have it on hand. Um, yeah, and then I believe that concludes the screen share um, of the of how to uh, access the application materials. So I will turn it back to the. slides sorry let's make sure that that's shared yeah so i think everyone should be able to see this again right so the submission process um applications are due by 5 p.m on friday october 7th to sharepoint um to the folder that will be shared upon submitting the microsoft forms um, that would grant you access to your folder. And then um, that survey needs to be completed by 5 p.m. on Friday, September 23rd, 2022. And then um, we will provide you a direct link upon filling out the intent survey. And um, we will lock access to the folder after the submission deadline. And I will hand it to Sarah to go over the threshold and scoring criteria. Great, thanks, Kavleen. Thanks for, for walking us through all of that. Um, so I will now highlight a few important points regarding threshold and scoring criteria. So first up on the next slide, we have general completeness. We wanna ensure that all full applications that we receive um, include all of the required materials. Um, and our application instructions that Ina and Kavleen uh, touched upon, as well as the applicant workbook um, will help applicants um, meet these threshold criteria. So just um, pay uh, close attention in reviewing those uh, materials. And so I'll just go quickly down this uh, list. So for general completeness, we want to see um, application materials are fully completed, application documents are properly labeled, uh, stored in the proper file structure, and are easily accessible on um, the SharePoint. All required activities are reflected in the work plan, so using the um, alphabetical code um, that Kathleen outlined for us will be really important. Uh, work plan to adhere to the three-year project completion period and contain sufficient detail. Uh, budgets contain sufficient detail and are accompanied by any necessary 
and necessary supporting documentation. Um, you include a approved resolution or letter of authorization um, if you if the managing stakeholder is a federally recognized tribal government. Um, if the managing stakeholder is a public agency, you'll need to include a formal resolution. And all co-applicants um, have provided a letter of commitment. Next slide. So for uh, applicant eligibility, this one's super uh, simple and easy. Just double check that your managing stakeholder and co-applicants are eligible organizations um, or eligible applicants. Um, and you can refer to our eligible applicant list on page 14 of the guidelines. Um, next slide. For the collaborative stakeholder structure, you must include four partners, and that includes the managing stakeholder. So if you did submit a pre-proposal and you um, included less than four partners, just be aware that you will have to add additional partners to your proposal for the full application to meet uh, eligibility thresholds. Um, and then also revisit pages 16 and 17 of the guidelines to ensure that your partnership agreement includes all of the requirements. Um, use, utilize Using our partnership agreement template that is in the application packet could also be useful in uh, pulling this together. Next slide. So threshold criteria for the project area, your region must be between one and eight contiguous counties and your communities of focus cannot be smaller than two census tracts. 51% uh, of your census tracts uh, selected as communities of focus need to qualify as under-resourced communities. And uh, your, when you submit your full application, this was not required for the pre-proposal, you'll need to include a project area map as described on pages 10 and 11 of the guidelines. And we also have details on this in the application instructions. Next slide. Um, so the full uh, applications will be scored out of a total of 150 points. And as you'll see here, the bulk of the points fall within the criteria of project need and region, program uh, objectives and strategies, and collaborative stakeholder structure. Um, so in addition to this table, we do provide detailed scoring um, information and guidance on pages 26 through 33 of the guidelines. And we encourage applicants to review that um, section very carefully as you prepare your full application to ensure that you are um, getting as many points as you can as possible, particularly for these three core sections um, that have 40 points available. Uh, next slide. Okay, and the last uh, note from me here is regarding review and award. So following the October 7th submission deadline, applications will be reviewed and evaluated by SGC staff and an interagency review panel. Uh, following the initial application review, members of the review panel uh, will conduct interviews with our top scoring applicants. Um, and then SGC anticipates making awards at the public council meeting on December 15th of this year. Um, and just to reiterate, applications must meet all eligibility requirements upon submission. Applications having materials that are inconsistent will not be uh, rated or ranked. So if you don't meet threshold uh, criteria, we won't continue on um, reviewing your full application. And as Kathleen noted, we'll uh, lock access to your folder uh, at that 5 p.m. submission deadline. And so you'll be unable to modify um, any piece of your application following um, that deadline. So I know that was pretty quick. And so if you have any questions about this process, please um, ask during the Q&A. And for now, I'll turn it back to Kathleen to share about the technical assistance. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, so we do have um, application technical assistance available. Um, and, and they will um, help out with um, filling or completing the application and uh, provide guidance. Um, I'll just go down the bullets here. So respond to the applicant's questions and provide clarity around program goals and requirements, guidance on stakeholder engagement and outreach to develop work plan elements, supporting applicants and facilitating an effective 
partnership, development, and collaborative stakeholder structure, providing mapping support and supporting and preparing for interviews during the selection process. And uh, we have a really great TA team who um, uh, are who Anna from um, Estelon, or Hannah from Estelano Advisors will um, talk more about who's on the team. So Hannah, I will uh, turn it to you briefly. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, hi, everyone. I apologize, my video isn't working. Um, but my name is Hannah Diaz, and I am a senior associate at Estelano Advisors. And in addition to our firm, we also have the Institute for Local Government, California Coalition for Rural Housing, and the Better World Group as the technical assistance providers for the RCC program. And many of you may have already been in touch with one or more of our organizations throughout this pre-proposal process. Um, and I know we're all looking forward to, to getting to know you all and your projects um, in this so I will hand it back over to Kathleen. Great, thanks Hannah. Um, so that concludes our overview of the technical assistance and I'll hand it back to Ina and Sarah to facilitate the Q&A. Great. Yeah, thank you Kathleen and, and Sarah for walking through all of those pieces. I think we can, um, Go to the q and I've definitely been keeping tabs on the questions that have been coming into the Q&A box. Um, and we have a question here. Will feedback from pre-proposal let us know if we're on track for meeting scoring criteria or getting points? Um, and for this question, I think it's a great question. The feedback that we're going to be offering is very much focused on threshold. Um, so really trying to help folks make sure that they meet threshold. We won't be commenting on the competitiveness of proposals, um, but we will, you know, if there are applicants that have projects that aren't really in line with the program objectives, um, we'll flag those kinds of things too, even if they're not kind of written out in the list of threshold criteria, but um, that's that's really the, the key um, piece that we'll be providing feedback on at this stage. But working with the TA providers um, and having some conversations about um, about how to you know develop the proposal, there may be opportunities to kind of um, get some more feedback and work with the TA providers on on projects. Um, well, the pre-proposals we made available for public view. We don't have any plans to share pre-proposals publicly. Um, they are public documents, but um, so at, to the extent that, you know, if we were to get PR aid, we would have to um, to share them, but we don't have any plan to kind of post them publicly, um, just trying to make sure that we're um, keeping, uh, I guess, keeping those things um, private. Do we have any other questions? We're also happy to go re revisit any of the material that was previously screen shared um, or mentioned if it would be helpful to walk through any of that again. Definitely. Yeah, I see a question from William. Are established collaboratives eligible? Um, yes, established collaboratives are definitely eligible. We welcome both new collaboratives that are coming together just for this uh, grant program as well as any established um, collaboratives, as long as the work that they're doing is in line with um, the goals and objectives of, of our program. And just as a reminder too, you can feel free to include questions in the Q&A box or also to um, raise your hand and come off mute if you have a question that you'd prefer to ask verbally, that's an option as well. You know, we did get this question that came through the chat. Can a partner hire a consultant to help with some of the tasks or should it be all, uh, should it all be staff time from the four plus partners? 
That's a great question. So there is an opportunity to be able to bring on contractors as a part of the RCC. Um, there's some guidance in our guidelines on the role of contractors. Um, they don't necessarily need to be a part of the collaborative stakeholder structure, um, although they can if they are also an eligible applicant to the program. So yes, that certainly is um, an eligible cost. I would just say trying to make sure that it doesn't take an outsized portion of the budget is probably a good idea um, because obviously those that funding can um, can rack up for sure. Um, and so want to make sure that we're also focusing a lot on being able to build the capacity of the organizations that are part of that collaborative stakeholder structure. But that's a really good question. Thanks. Um, looks like we also have a question here. Should staff hour rates be inclusive of costs for benefits and or indirect costs for the staff cost detail? Um, so for the staff cost detail, we'll want the fully burdened rate. So essentially it should be inclusive of all of the benefits. Um, the indirect cost rate um, is set up a little bit separately as a part of the budget. So we'll have, um, you'll have up to a 30% indirect cost rate for the, the total application. Um, but for the staff hour rates, they should be that fully burdened rate. Um, great. Then we have a question. Can you explain the relationship with the SURF program and any requirements or desired outcomes? Um, that is a really good question. So the SURF program is the um, Community Economic Resiliency Fund program. Um, and that program actually calls out in their guidelines specifically um, that the those collaboratives are supposed to work with the regional climate collaboratives to the extent that that is applicable and makes sense for them um and so i think you know there is an opportunity for there to be some coordination and collaboration um with those collaborative structures um to the extent that applicants would like to we do have a required um activity as a part of our um, of our program that focuses on workforce um, and workforce development and anti-displacement strategies. And so, um, you know, if that seems to align really well, there could be an opportunity to coordinate or collaborate with a SURF, um, but it's not a requirement explicitly for our program. Um, great. And then we have a question from William here. I, about the maximum amount that can be awarded. Um, the maximum amount is 1.75 million for the program. The range is between 500,000 and 1.75 million. You know, we also have a question from the chat. Um, what are SGC's thoughts on AB 1640 uh, or the regional collaborative networks? I personally haven't looked too much into this um, yet. Um, but I don't know if you've been in conversations about this legislation. I have not. I don't necessarily have anything to add there, um, but that's a great, a great question and something we can maybe look into more and provide some additional information in our Q&A. Great question. Can we talk about how equity is addressed in this program? Um, that is an excellent question. So I think the program addresses equity in a number of different ways. Um, and I may not actually touch on all of them. I think there are lots of different ways that, um, that collaboratives can be addressing equity. Um, but I think from the program perspective, um, you know, we, equity, advancing equity is one of the core program objectives. And so it's definitely something that's very central to this program. Um, in developing the program, we really did a lot of work to engage with stakeholders across the state and, and make sure that the program was really as responsive as possible to under-resourced communities in the state. Um, we engaged with over 400 stakeholders um, and really tried to make sure that it was as responsive and inclusive as possible. Um, 
our requirements also are very much focused on supporting those um, most under-resourced communities in the state. Um, and then I think looking at the required activities as a part of the grant, there are a lot of those that are really very much focused on community engagement, uh, working with vulnerable populations and, um, and advancing equity. And so, um, you know, to the extent that, you know, I think the program like activities and really the core work that RCCs will be doing will be very much focused on, on climate equity, um, on supporting um, move forward on environmental justice related issues. Um, so that's a great question. There probably, I could go on for, for much longer on, on this question, because I think there are a lot of ways that we're hoping that this program helps to advance equity. Um, but the program was really built uh, in many ways out of the technical assistance that we've provided up until now, which again is really trying to focus on leveling the playing field a bit and helping applicants that may not have been able to benefit from state grants um, because of a lack of capacity to really help um, give them an opportunity to to access those resources a little bit more um, and and be able to um, yeah to meet those equity related goals so Thanks very much for that question. It's a great question. Sarah, I don't know if you had anything to add there too. I wanted to just add that maybe you, you said this, but my brain is short circuiting today, um, that we are able to offer advanced payments through this program as well. And so 25% of the uh, total grant award can be administered through advanced payments. And we have language in our guideline that um, outlines that those advanced payments need to go to the smaller uh, community-based organizations or, or partners within the collaborative that um, might have challenges, like cash flow challenges and enable them to initiate, initiate the work. Um, so that is one other component of the program that um, we're hoping um, has equitable outcomes. Great. Yeah, your brain did not short circuit. I forgot to mention that. So that's, I'm glad you jumped in um, with that piece too. Um, when do you anticipate providing feedback from the pre-proposals? Um, yeah, so this is a great question. We are trying to have a turnaround that's as quick as possible. We did receive quite a few pre-proposals. Um, and so we are trying to get through them as quickly as we can. We're aiming to be able to provide written feedback by the week of August 1st. Um, we may be able to get it out earlier, but I think um, we that's probably um, sort of the most realistic timeline. And then we will at that point also be putting folks in touch with the technical assistance providers that will be able to support them. So um, you'll be receiving emails if you submitted a pre-proposal that kind of lay out some of that feedback and then have that handoff um, to kind of work through some of those pieces as well as any other pieces that you'd like to work with the TA providers on on your full application. Um, great, is this a cost reimbursement grant? I think um, Sarah actually just spoke a little bit to the advanced pay piece, but I wonder, Sarah, if you wanted to add anything uh, related to our advanced pay process or requirements. Um. Yeah, so 25% of the grant can be administered or can be paid in advance. Um, and during the grant agreement process, uh, grantees or collaborators will identify who within their collaborative structure will be getting the, the advance payments and on what, you know, is that going to be lump sums or is it going to be split out? into smaller periodic payments. And um, those folks will then need to submit a pre uh, advanced pay request form. Um, it'll be, it will provide the template um, just outlining the purpose for the advanced pay and what those advanced funds will be utilized for. And then unfortunately, the remaining 75% of those of the grant award will need to be on a reimbursed uh, basis. And so we will work uh, with grantees during the grant agreement process to identify what frequency works for them. Does it need to be monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, um, whatever makes the most sense. We, we want to be flexible and work with all of our grantees um, to build out those timelines. Thanks, Sarah. 
Um, it looks like we have a question here. Will you release the names of the pre-proposers so that CBOs and others can reach out to join the teams? Um, this is a really good question. I get, we got a question about this yesterday as well. And so I think we'll need to put a little bit more thought into this um, and we'll, we'll share that out in the Q&A document. Um, but it's, it's good to know that there's, um, that there's a request for this out there. Um, and we'll get back to folks on that piece. I thought I saw an attendee's hand raised. Um, did someone want to come off mute or was that an accident? Maybe um, an accident, um, but no, you are very welcome to um, ask questions orally. Um, there were actually uh, two questions, Ina, that folks submitted when registering that I thought would be really helpful to answer here. And so one is, can a for-profit business focused on climate and sustainability apply um, for this opportunity? Um, I'll let you answer that first and then I'll go into the next question. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So small businesses are called out specifically as an eligible applicant to the program. Um, so if, if the for-profit organization qualifies as a small business, then that's a pretty simple um, yes. We do also have kind of a broader eligibility bucket that focuses on organizations that have um, experience, I'm not gonna remember the exact language, but experience providing uh, community-based outreach and technical assistance, I think. Um, and so that is um, another opportunity for, you know, if there is a for-profit organization that has experience doing that, um, that is also an opportunity as well. Awesome, thanks. Um, and then, oh, actually, just kidding. There's three questions. These two were asked together. So what are the program's expectations beyond the three-year grant period? And can an activity and outcome during the grant period be the exploration and establishment of a new administrative entity, such as a joint powers authority or special district? Great questions. Um, so in terms of expectations past the three-year grant term, I think, you know, officially SGC doesn't have any specific expectations for folks past the grant term because you'll no longer be in an agreement with us. But I think we would love to see, you know, the work move forward and for there be, to be kind of the the capacity that's been built during the grant term can kind of continue to move on and the partnerships move on and the projects continue. Um, as a part of our um, grant requirements, we do ask um, that the collaboratives put together a capacity building toolbox that can be a really helpful resource for, um, for other folks working in the region. Um, and so hopefully that will be a piece that can then live on and continue to be a really helpful tool um, for folks, as well as um, an inventory of the specific projects that are kind of ready um, that have been developed through the regional climate collaboratives process. So um, those are two deliverables that are very much focused on trying to help with that um, long-term sort of longevity and, and adding some, um, some sustainability to the work that it goes on um, through the regional climate collaboratives. Um, but yeah, I think those are the main things that come to mind. I think we'd definitely love to see the work continue to move forward. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess that's the first question. And then the second question, um, can it be focused on the creation of a joint powers authority? I think in order to like respond to that specific question, it would be important to dive in a little bit more into the details of what that um, would entail and, and kind of what the focus is. But I think as long as it's something that really fits within the, the program objectives and, um, and within the activities that can be funded through the program, um, you know, that could, potentially be a project that would make sense. We certainly are looking to be able to build 
the administrative capacity and, and the capacity more broadly to work on climate related issues um, in, you know, through the work that happens through RCCs. So um, yeah, I think, you know, certainly be creative and, and think about, you know, some different um, pieces that can help your region really move forward on those climate related goals. Um, and if it is sort of creating organizations, um, that could be something that that might be a good fit for um, for an RCC to put together. Are there any other questions? Oh, hold on, let me see. Um, Surf did release names for teaming opportunities to partner. Okay, that's helpful to know. Um, thanks for sharing that. I think um, that's something that we can put some more thought into, um, but really appreciate um, seeing that come through as a suggestion. Um, can you tell us how many pre-proposals were received? Yes, yeah, so we have received approximately 89 pre-proposals, but we also, some of those were bots or unfinished um, pre-proposals. So we're kind of going through and making sure that, um, you know, all of the pre-proposals were fully completed. So I think we'll have a, a slightly smaller number um, of applications that are, are completed pre-proposals. Um, but we did definitely get a lot of interest in the program and we're very excited to see that. Um, so yeah, um, that's, that's as, as much as, as I'm able to share at this point, just at the point that we're in um, currently in review. Um, then, um erica is saying that she joined the linkedin group that sgc started coordinating with others but is not sure if um they saw that they saw any activity there um yeah so the linkedin group um is a basically a forum that sgc created for folks to partner as much as they would like um we don't do any kind of facilitation of that space because we do need to keep um, our distance in terms of not, you know, pressuring folks to, to work together or, or to kind of create um, partner teams. Um, I've seen a few messages come forward, but I think a lot of times they're also kind of direct messages or, or folks are able to reach out to one another through that. Um, another thing that we have done quite a bit in the past um, is to share the registration for our webinars. We always send out an email in advance asking folks if they would like to have their name omitted from that list and would rather that their information not be shared. Um, so we can do that this time as well. Um, but if there are folks who are interested in us sharing their contact information with the other folks who um, who join this webinar, we certainly can do that. Um, and if anyone would like for us to not include their information, um, please feel free to either send us like a, a direct message chat now or to send an email. Um, and I can actually drop in the chat. One thing I wanted to mention is that at any time you can reach out to the tasgc.ca.gov email address to ask questions. Um, and we do regularly update the frequently asked questions on our website with all of the questions that come forward um, via email, since we realize that those questions can often be very useful um, for, for other applicants as well. Um, there's another question that came through the chat, and maybe we can uh, kick this one to the TA providers that we have on the, the webinar today. Is direct TA available to partners named in the pre proposal? Um, I would, yes. So for any partner who is named in the pre proposal, we we're happy to work with them. Um, and I think once the TA assignments are released, we can get started on that process with reaching out to both the managing stakeholder and 
the entire RCC partner applicants. Thanks, I'm not sure if anybody has anything else to add to that. I don't have anything else to add to that. I think the one thing that I will mention is that, um, as I mentioned, we did receive quite a few pre-proposals. Um, of course, we're still in the process of going through them and there may be teams that end up collaborating with one another, um, but do wanna ask that folks recognize that our TA providers will certainly be very busy working with all of the TA um, recipients. And so just to, um, be patient as much as possible um, through that process. I think the TA providers will be doing as much as they can. It's a really, really great team with four different organizations that are really strong and have a lot of um, excellent folks on staff and, and great capacity, um, but they certainly will be very busy. So I think, um, yeah, if, if a partner on a project is really wanting a lot of, of support. I think in some cases that may make sense and be possible, but there is also um, going to be a bit of a balancing act between all of the applicants that are um, that are putting together proposals for RCC. So I do want to note that we only have two more minutes of this webinar. Um, I think we have time for one more question if there is one. Um, or otherwise we can wrap up. Great. Well, um, please, again, feel free to reach out with any questions um, to send them to, oh, did something come in there? Yeah, just one more question from the chat, uh, asking for a list of the TA providers. So. That information is on our website in the application page, um, but we will also send out this slide that has um, those listed as well. Thanks, Sarah. That's great. Um, yeah, so I think that you know wraps up the webinar for today. But um, again, please do feel free to send us an email at ta at sgc.ca.gov if you have any questions about RCC um, as you're putting together your applications. We'll do our best to respond to them as quickly as possible. And as I said, we'll be putting those up on our website as well. Um, and yeah, really, really appreciate your time. I hope this was a helpful webinar and um, we're really looking forward to seeing the applications that you all um, send in on, on our October 7th deadline. Uh, so thank you very much. Hope you have a great rest of your day and um, we will look forward to being in touch in the future. Thanks.